Well, uh, we're getting towards the end of this series that we've called Windows and Mirrors about the parables of Jesus. We've got another couple to go. Uh, but what we find, is, of course, is when we open up these parables is that we find a different world being opened up to us. A set of illustrations and stories that demonstrate to us that God's kingdom, the kingdom that's owned by and run by the Lordship of Jesus, flips us on our head. And today's one of those days it does exactly that. It flips us on our head. So if you'd like to leave now, you've got one second. Sorry, you missed out. All right. You see, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at something that is probably, again, quite familiar to us, a story about a, a wealthy guy and uh, how the Lord wanted to challenge him about his, his lifestyle choices. And uh, this is going to jump right in on us today. And uh, I can guarantee you that. So we're going to start with this story that um, Jesus tells. And it begins in a very, very um, earthy way. He's being challenged by a guy who wants to sort out a family problem for him. It starts like this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to, invite, to divide the inheritance with me. So clearly this guy's got a few family problems going on. And dividing an inheritance can be a problem. If mum and dad haven't set it up well, or maybe they've done it unfairly, or maybe someone's just jumped in and grabbed the lot and decided that it's theirs for the having and no one else can have any part of it. Family problems, of course. These are what Jesus has been confronted with. But Jesus jumps in straight away. And what he's wanting to do here is he's wanting to challenge not just this question about family money, but he wants to take the conversation up. Okay? So immediately Jesus says this. Uh, Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Okay, so he's saying, I'm not getting into this. I'm not getting into this. This is something for you to work out. But what Jesus is going to do is he's going to raise the conversation level. He's going to raise the perspective in which we talk about money or value money or think about money. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit like when a, a man goes into a grocery shop and he finds that his favorite loaf of bread is not there and it hasn't been there for a week or so. So he goes up to the grocer and he says, hey, listen, where's my Vogels? Where's my Vogels? Haven't had any here for ages. And the grocer, instead of apologizing, pulls out a, a picture of a starving child from the African continent. At that moment, any bread will do. You see, what's happened is the perspective has been changed. You're not so worried about your first world problem. John Ortberg uh, is a, a really good author and pastor, and uh, he wrote a book called When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. And this has become a real uh, point or touchstone for him over the years. And this title of this story came from when he was watching his children play Monopoly. And his oldest son won the game and was proudly jumping around the lounge telling uh, his siblings, how clever he was, how cool he was, how he had all the money and they were poor. And mum came into the lounge and said, okay, guys, it's dinner time. Clean it up, it all goes back in the box. And John said, isn't that so true for life? That at the end of the day, it all goes back in the box. We don't get to take it with us. And so what Jesus is going to do with this parable is he's going to challenge not only his generation, but he's going to challenge us here today with the words that he had to say about a rich man who was foolish. Let's see. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Okay, simple parable in many respects, uh, one we've probably read before, uh, but what has it done for us and to us? That's the question that the Word of God is always searching our heart with. So the first thing that uh, Jesus reminds us of is that 
Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, He tells us, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And some of your Bibles will say the word covetousness. And covetousness is, comes to us from the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And it's a strong desire for another's possessions or influence or relationships. Covetousness is not just, I like your new car and I really, really want one. Uh, it's, it's bigger than that. It's, uh, I want your life. I want your friendships. I want your influence. Sure, I want your money and I want your wife. You know, these are the things that can, that can be covetous uh, for any of us at any given time. And human, the human condition at a certain level is always trying to uh, fight with this. It's trying to pull it down, push it down, suppress these urges for greed. And yet the world we live in does the, the opposite, doesn't it? It tells us that if you have that deodorant, all the girls are going to chase you down the street. You know? Wow. You know, if you drive this car, everybody will think you're successful and cool, you know. And so you've got all these different labels, all this marketing centered around uh, the idea that if you have this, purchase this, you will be this. And people will just think you're awesome. All right. And we fight all the time, don't we? We push back on that all the time because we know it's not true. And yet it's still very, very appealing. You see, covetousness wants us to be the center of attention. And somehow, if we can get that secret recipe, we can market ourselves in a way that allows us to be cool. Uh, 81% of all 16-year-olds would like to be an influencer on social media. Okay, I read this in the, during the week out of American newspaper, 81% of all 16-year-olds. Okay, And uh, 16% of all 81-year-olds don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So you've got, you've got this challenge where people want to put themselves right at the center and to be somebody who's, at least in their own imagination, somebody of importance. Uh, it's a Texan proverb which says this, she has to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral, such that she wants the attention to be upon her. But what we notice in this, this parable is that the parable starts with um, an sort of a false premise around the rich guy. And it starts like this. It says, he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And uh, immediately we're told what it is that's happening here in this guy's life on his farm. It's the ground that has produced the harvest. And the, the crazy thing about it is that we so easily take uh, some level of kudos from the fact that the ground actually produces the harvest. Okay, God has set our world in motion, and it's a beautiful thing. We don't even stop to think about how accurate and how amazing the seasons are. You know, we've got spring, summer, autumn, winter, and that cycle of harvest and planting and harvest. And then you take this little seed loaded with genetic information and DNA, you put it in the ground, and just the magic of water and sunshine and earth, and boof, we've got a crop that feeds us. And so here we've got this guy saying, Look, you know, it's about me. And, and the world is in this tension right now too because we think if we can manipulate our world around us, we'll produce more and we'll be better off for it. It's a sort of father God versus mother nature. That seems to be the debate. But what it leads us to is this idea that we're in control and that we've produced this crop, therefore we own it and therefore we're responsible for it and we can have it all to ourselves. So let's have a look at this guy's attitude again. We'll push on on this. It says, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And what I want you to notice is how often the guy speaks about himself in these few verses here when he talks about uh, the I and the my and I will and I will and I will, uh, my grain. And uh, what's happening here is that this guy is transferring his security from God to money, okay? He's transferring his security from God to money. And the scary thing about this, if we go back and look at that scripture, if we look at that verse 19, it says, and I'll, at the bottom it says, and I'll say to you myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. 
that looks like something that's very familiar to us, something that's sold to us on a daily basis. It's called retirement. It's called retirement. Accumulate for yourself a big, fat KiwiSaver account. Accumulate for yourself all the wealth that you can generate and then take life easy. Go to the golf course. Get that e-bike. Go to Bali. Get that camper van and just take life easy. Just take life easy. Can we say easy? Easy. And this is what we're being sold. And this is what we very easily buy because it's so attractive. And it's so locked into the Western dream that we sanctify it and we normalize it and we just embrace it completely. And yet here we're being told that this guy was a rich fool. Why? Because it was all about him. And what we've got here is this guy transferring his confidence from God to his money, from God to his bank account, from God to his barns, from God to his KiwiSaver account, from God to his investment portfolio whatever that might be. You see, the rich fool doesn't have faith that God could or would bless the ground in the next season. He shut shop. He shut shop. And this is the, the power of this, this parable, is that it tells us that we shouldn't be shutting shop. We shouldn't be just simply taking care of ourselves. There's a world around us that can be blessed by who we are and what we bring and how we do it. Um, in Ecclesiastes, which we've got to realize is background reading to the New Testament, realizing that Ecclesiastes had been there for a few hundred years and uh, would have been a mindset that would have been adopted by the religious community about wealth. But again, it's easily challenged and easily overcome. But let's go home and have a look at what Ecclesiastes says in this chapter. It says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Okay, some powerful words here. You'd think this is written by an economist. Uh, straight out of the Reserve Bank. He says, oh, look, we know that as the amount of goods increase, people are going to buy them. Why? Because we market them in such a way that you can't do without them. Yeah? And, and that's just the way the world works. And it goes on. We're going to read it quite, a little, quite a bit of this chapter. Let me read it to you. It says, the sleep of a laborer is sweet whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Why? Because they're worried. You know, all the stock market <laughs> crashing, house prices coming back, interest rates going up. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. For wealth lost through some misfortune so that, they have children, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Do you notice that wealthy people aren't necessarily ha happy people? Yeah, you read, you read that in the media again and again. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. So if you've got money and you're happy, God's blessed you. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them, God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. And this last verse here captures this story of the rich fool. Why? Because he has hoarded his grain to the point where he's not even prepared to sell it, maybe to people who needed it. And this is where that whole social conscience is always a big part of Scripture, and even here today. So Jesus is alluding to the guy who hoards his wealth, and he's got two problems. Firstly, he thinks it's all for himself, and secondly, he's not taking 
any form of social responsibility, even to the point where he could sell it, sell it to those who were in need, sell it to those whose crops didn't come in, sell it to those who he has shared his life with in his community. So he is taking complete care of himself, but no care or responsibility for his neighbors. And this is a a powerful uh, illustration that is bringing this parable to life. And so the question comes, of course, is shall we be a river or a reservoir? Yeah, a river or a reservoir. Now, a a reservoir can get stagnant, yeah, because there's no water coming through it. A river is actually a breach in that reservoir. It says, I will have confidence that as that water leaves, more is going to come. And that's what we've been told in Ecclesiastes. To those who are generous, God will give more. It's perfectly understandable, isn't it? If you were wanting to sow seeds of generosity within the community, would you give it to people who give it away? Would you give it to people who hold on to it? You'd give it to people who give away. And this is one of the upside-down dynamics of the kingdom, is that those who have been given much is required, and God will bless you more as a result of it. Um, Currently, we're living in my son's house, um, because he's overseas, and we've been given the responsibility to look after his dog, all right? Um, his dog <laughs> is a black Russian terrier. Uh, this is not his dog. His dog's a little bit smaller. It's only a puppy weighing at 50 kilos um, and is only 11 months old. But he will max out at 75 kilograms. Now, Michaela and I took him for a walk yesterday, twice actually, but that's not actually true. It took us for a walk yesterday. And I swear, look, my one arm's longer than the other, see? The only advantage you've got with a dog this size is when you're going uphill, it's like being on an escalator. It just pulls you up, away you go. But the challenge for us is who is leading who? And so it is with money. Who leads who? Are you in control of your finances and where they're going? Or are they in control of you and you just follow along with the idea of accumulation? Um, There's this great illustration. It's very, very simple. It talks about closing the circle. You know, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, we're told by Jesus. Closing the circle, it talks about what we do financially. Uh, You get to the point where God is going to say to you, you've got enough. Enough is enough. And you then close your circle on your personal wealth. Okay? You've got that house you wanted or one that you need. And uh, everything is, is fine. It's in place. And then you make a decision that outside of that, you will use that money to build and bless the kingdom of God. Be rich towards God, as the scripture challenges us to. The challenge, though, is to close it, isn't it? Because everything in the world around us tells us to keep it open. Every time you watch commercials online or on your television, they're challenging you to open it up, keep it open, have a new experience, have this and have that, and that will allow you to experience life in its fullness. But God has a completely different view of that. He says, listen, in the midst of uh, accumulation, don't retire, but certainly retire your expectations. Retire your expectations so that you can say, this is where I'm at, enough is enough, And after that, I can extend the kingdom. I've used this quote from Brian Hathaway before, and it absolutely ruins me. Brian Hathaway is an old uh, brethren pastor who who literally passed away about 20 years ago. Um, Real great Kiwi and uh, great man of God. He said this. He said, our responsibility is to earn as much money as we can, to live on as little as we can, and to use the rest to build the kingdom of God. Okay, earn as much as we can, live on as little as we can, and use the rest to build the kingdom of God. And you know what I hate about that saying? Is that I can't find anything wrong with it. I can't find anything to push back on that. I can't find anything to, to, to twist that in such a way as that will serve my purpose of accumulation. You know, we're all going to face this, and uh, we all face it on a daily basis. But when we get to the point where we get to the stage of life where we retire, and often retirement is about you know, just making sure that you've got enough 
to see you through. So retirement doesn't have to happen at pension age at 65. It could happen at any stage of your life, depending on your circumstances. The challenge that is being put to us is that we should be generous and we shouldn't slow down the production of money. If you're in a position where you know how to make money, you've been gifted to make money, hey, for sure, over years, ease off. You know, we don't expect you to do, you know, 60-hour weeks when you're 85 years old. But be the person God has called you to be. There's a tremendous shift that has happened in the West over the last 40 years. They call it the, the, uh, the emergence of the third age. Okay, back in my grandparents' day, to hit 65 was an achievement yeah, because just because of lifestyle and medical uh, ability to keep you alive. To hit 65, a majority of people worked hard laboring. They wore themselves out, okay? And so that's where your life was sort of expected to end from there on in. But now to hit 60, they say 60 is the new 40, or 40 is the new, 60 is the new 40, yeah, that's right. And so you've got this whole third age ahead of you. And instead of taking the soft option of just going, I'll put my feet up and watch Emmerdale Farm and um, all those other great TV programs, um, you should be preparing for, planning towards what you can do with that third age. Because usually by the time you've hit the end of your second age, you've got the ability to just simply eat, drink, and be merry, okay, in an average world, average scenario. But being prepared for the third age says that you're going to use all of your skills, all of your resources to then reproduce more for the kingdom of God. And this is where this parable uh, really, really hits us hard because it wasn't just about the fact that he had got lazy. It's just the fact that he had missed an opportunity. He'd missed an opportunity. Instead of trusting God that he, God could do it again, another great harvest and another great harvest and another great harvest. And he could have been in a position where he could have just blessed that whole village or that whole town and just been a person of tremendous positive influence. Yeah? When we see the fruit of the Spirit, this long list of uh, different character traits that we're called to uh, work at over our life, we find there's a real simple one in there called kindness. Kindness. Kindness is looking out for others, isn't it? Simple as that. Kindness is being treated the way that you'd like to be treated. Okay, and, uh, and faithfulness. You've got some fantastic imagery to draw upon here. And so when it comes to living your best life, you live your best life by constraining what it is that you will spend on yourself to be a blessing to others around you. Yeah? And this is what this parable is telling us. This parable is actually telling us that when you just simply shut shop, put all your money in your big barn and just sit around waiting to spend it, you're actually not doing God a favor at all. You're doing yourself a favor. And you're not actually working the kingdom to the best of God's advantage, to God's advantage. I mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago, I haven't got someone here, I'll jump down and get it. The, um, the paddle. I said that um, if you've been coming to this church for a while, um, it's like, welcome, welcome to our walker, welcome to our canoe. And, um, but don't just jump in for the ride, pick up a paddle. Yeah, get in motion with what God is doing around here. The same thing applies financially. Get on board financially with what we're doing here. The, the end result is that the more we have in the life of the church, and I'm, I say this knowing that there's a lot said about money in churches in recent times. People are all over us about money in churches. All I can say is that our books are open. I don't have any idea what anybody gives here. I've been here 27 years, and I, from day one I said, I will never know and I don't want to know. that You give to God. You give to what it is that God is doing through here. But get on board financially. Be rich towards God. Okay? Don't rely on somebody else's money to keep the walker motivated, to keep the walker moving, to keep the walker momentum going. And you'll find yourself in a position where you're investing in the things of the kingdom, which will allow you to then look at this parable and say, yeah, God, I got this one, I got this one covered. People have been bringing their tithes into the church 
or the equivalent of the church for three and a half thousand years since the day of Abraham. This is the way God has always moved. And this is the way he will continue to move into the future. And uh, don't, don't, don't try to argue your way out of it. Don't try to be the lawyer. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm not even talking here about capital gain, where most of our money actually comes from. Um, if you'd like me to talk about that, I will. I can tell the hesitancy there. You'd rather I didn't. <laughs> so let's get back to our, our mate. We'll call him Bart, shall we? Bart, the rich fool. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. This could be the promise line for any KiwiSaver account in New Zealand, couldn't it? Eh? Come and invest with us. We're going to build bigger barns so that your money can earn more money by making money for you to then eat, drink, and be merry and take life easy. Put that new battery on your e-bike. Get that bigger motor home. Yeah, buy that bigger jet ski. Eh? Go on that longer holiday. You too can uh, prosper with my KiwiSaver account. Craig's KiwiSaver. Come and invest with me. See, this is how... Yeah, I'm not serious about that one, but this is how it works. We get invited to a dream. We get invited to a promise. And it's a, a promise that competes with what we are told by God is the better way. But how loudly do we hear this voice? Really loudly, because when I bring a contradiction to that, like I have just by opening up this simple parable, we find ourselves in a very, very sober place. Because we say, whilst we've been following the Lord, most of us all of our lives, we find that at a very, very deep level, we're actually asking God to bless the pattern of the world. That is what needs challenging. That is what needs to be have the, have the, the rug pulled out from underneath it. And we stare at it and we say, hey, God's blessed me enough to be here financially. And he's also blessed me enough to have a third age. Yeah, more time where I can do some absolutely astounding things. Because why? I've got my health. I've got money. I've got experience. I've got intelligence. And I've got time, and I've got a church family that if we all get on board with it, we could do it together, which makes it a heck of a lot of fun. And instead of 30 cleft pallets in the Philippines, we could have had 300 cleft pallets. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what we're about. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. So we have to flip the switch on what we think our life journey towards is all about. It's not towards the life easy the eat, the drink, the be merry. It's about working with accuracy. It's about being an entrepreneur when you're 80 years old. You know, it's about being excited about the energy you got at 60 years old. It's taking on kingdom challenges and taking personal responsibility for some of the outcomes that God would drop in your lap. That is a 180 degree flip on what the world says that you should be doing. Does it make sense? Makes sense. Doesn't make it easier though, does it? Makes sense. Remember? But God said to him, you fool. Yeah? Who was the fool? The guy who was just eating and drinking and being merry. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? <laughs> what is he saying? It all goes back in the box. It all goes back in the box. So as we draw this talk to a close, let's go back to what influenced the community that Jesus was speaking to. In Ecclesiastes, the writer Solomon said, so I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God, okay? So it's not the accumulation of wealth, it's the joy of experiencing the life that consists, or should I say, exists within the doing of life. Jesus' opening comment was, uh, you can accumulate all the things, but life does not consist of itself in those possessions. 
It's what goes on in the middle of it all. And there's more. And there's more. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. You see, what we fail to acknowledge so often is that God knows how our best life can be lived. But we see a comment like that, and we actually argue with it. We disagree with it. We say, nah, I know how to live my best life. I know what I will enjoy. I know that what will put a smile on my dial. And God is saying, no, 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 hold on. If you're rich towards me, that's your best life, your greatest reward, your greatest joy, your greatest level of um, contentment is going to come from pouring your heart and your life into the things of the kingdom. Be rich towards me, God says. And that is a huge, huge challenge for all of us who live in this world where everything is driven by every market force to tell us the complete opposite. Yeah? It's a big challenge, eh? It's a big challenge. The rich fool. The rich fool. I find the simple parable to be incredibly challenging. I find it really, really difficult. Why? Because um, when we open up Scripture, what we actually want and expect is something that my son's dog wants, and that's just to tickle his tummy. We expect Scripture to tickle our tummy and tell us, you're doing all right. This is exactly where I want you to be. And we wait for those strokes of affirmation. The God is saying, fundamentally, we've got to flip this world upside down and live a life as if this life is the one that doesn't count, but the one that is to come is what's going to be counted. Yeah? It's tough, isn't it? It's challenging. It turns us upside down. And that, yet that is what has caused Christianity to change the world for thousands of years. This sort of stuff has turned a community around on itself to become the people of God who God wants us to be. And if we're not challenging each other with this, then we're just really a bunch of sanctified Western consumers. Yeah, that's what it looks like. But God is saying, no, use your money to flip things over so that the kingdom of God can be established in a way that is a sign and a wonder. Where generosity pours out of our lives, generosity pours out of our churches, lives given over to the kingdom of God in such a way that people can say, look at them, they walk to the beat of a different drum. Look at their community. Look how much they love one another, Jesus said. That will be the hallmark of how they know that we are his disciples. That's enough for one day, isn't it? <laughs> I've never seen such a quick amen. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, quick amen. Yeah, good. Get rid of that stinking paddle too. <laughs> hey, there was a, a great little illustration I got sent talking about paddles. Clint, um, Clint Harris, who was leading worship this morning, sent me this uh, just on Friday. And uh, in some European country, and I couldn't identify the language, they put a, a walker, a canoe, in a swimming pool. And um, they've got five, five, four or five guys in each end of it facing each other. And they have a rope right down the middle of the, the canoe. And, uh, and it's like a tug of war in a boat. It's cool. It's ready to go. And these guys are just going like this. And the crew, of course, that is the stronger, moves the other boat backwards. And after they hit it about four meters, um, whoo, you win, you lose. And I looked at that and I thought, that is such a powerful illustration for the way the world works, isn't it? And we are in one end of that walker and the world is in the other and we're going like this and they're going like this and we're going like this and they're going like this and they're getting tired and we're getting tired and the rope is there and it's moving this way or that way as it does in your life. You know, when you get that new car and you polish it, so beautiful. So beautiful, you know? And then you find 
You've been to the supermarket and someone scratches it and you cry, you know. So this is what this is all about. And the whole idea is that you need to push back on the ways of the world so that when the final hooter goes and you stand before the Lord, the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. You paddled your walk as flat out as you could. You gave it everything. That's what this life is best spent on. Yeah? Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. He's, he knows what's good for us. Let's stand for prayer, shall we? And Lord, we know that there's this, this black dog that wants to lead us in places where we don't want to go, but it has the strength to pull us over at times. And we're su- surrounded, Lord, by this intimidation of the world that tells us everything we should be and how we're supposed to live our lives. But we're told if we are rich towards you, Lord, then our lives count in ways that are immeasurable. Lord, we just want to pray that we can overcome the lies of the world by reading Scripture and not reading it, but living it, applying it to our lives, that we take you seriously, that our best life is lived when it's lived for you and we're rich towards you in every sense of the word. And so, God, I just want to pray for my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, we, we look at a word like this and we know it's so counterculture. We look at it, it's so aggressive in as much as uh, we see uh, people being called foolish for um, just taking it easy. And Lord, we, we also live in a world where we're super blessed to have a lifestyle expectation and a length of life that gives us more literal decades to glorify you. Give us wisdom, Lord. Give us, give us vision. Give us hope. Give us confidence that you can take our one and only life and help us spend it well. Lord, in everything that we do, we just trust, Lord God, that we can, we can look to you and you can shape our lives regardless of where they are now. But Lord, for those who in this moment say, well, hey, I feel like a, a reservoir that's going stagnant, I, I just pray, Lord, let there be a dam burst so that people can see needs and can pour the resources they have into that and that you would then fill it, Lord, afresh with your blessing. Lord, there's so many illustrations we can use to serve your purpose. But Lord, we just want to pray that collectively we can see what it is that Jesus said in this parable and use it to your glory. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.